Okay, so we're ready for the tea party for episode 8. In, in other words, it's basically like an epilogue. There's more to come. More things to cry. And at the end, I'll spend some time summarizing the plot and recapping things and explaining some of the less straightforward things. The majestic witch of theater going, drumming, drumming, drama and spectating, set down her pen, looked at the ceiling and sighed deeply. The desk was covered with a scattered mountain of paper covered with writing. Words were packed onto the pages in a thin, high information density language that only the great ones could read. Each language, or each letter of this language, carried the same amount of information as several books in the human world. These letters filled every inch of this huge pile of paper. Surely she had written out every little detail of some world. Yes, I have written it all. Though to be accurate, I have not truly written it all. She stood up, sat down in her favorite rocking chair, and rocked peacefully for a while. How far must one write before they could say they've written it all? That is what has bothered me in my years of writing. The adventures of humans can be very interesting as a tale. However, even I still don't know what that adventure stops being an adventure. My old friend, who is now gone, once said that a human's life is an adventure from beginning to end, so there is never a correct time to set down one's pen. I do not agree. I think one must put away the pen at some point. I believe one should write a tale to an appropriate point, then leave the aftertaste and opinions to the minds of the spectators. In short, the tale must be put inside a cat box at the appropriate time. The cat box has been the subject of this long tale, so is it not better to refrain from writing its demise, to instead put it in the cat box and leave it there? And make countless fan fictions! Featherine spoke to no one inside the empty study. Of course, no one commented on her words. However, Featherine seemed to hear something. She nodded and grinned contently. Yes, I know. I will write a bit further, then lay down my pen. Then it will be time for us to say our goodbyes. Featherine held up a finger and spun it around, a signal that she wanted to darken the room. The lights in the study dimmed. Would you mind letting me rest for a while? During that time, my cat... Or rather, my Miko will entertain you. Ow, ow, ow! You suck! Can't you be less clumsy with that needle? Shut up. If you don't want it sewn by hand, I'll use a sewing machine. No, no machines! I want you to do it by hand. So please, just be a little more gentle. Ow, ow! It'll get better if you spit on it. Ugh! Don't just start licking me all of a sudden! Hmm, I think this needle should be thick enough. This'll hurt like hell, so you'd better close your eyes. Five, four, three, two... Don't say that right before you start! Yeah! But despite all this, the two of them truly were close. Though Lando Delta had been brutally dismembered in the final fight, she had survived. But unfortunately, she was still dismembered. So Birkista was sewing her arms and head back on with a needle and a thread. The left arm, which was still waiting to be reattached, walked around the bed impatiently with its index and middle fingers. Only the arms were left to do, so it looked like this would be finished soon. Then Erica returned, slamming the door open. I'm home, my master. I bought some sesame salt. Why sesame salt? You aren't planning to put it in tea, are you? It's Erica's toy. Or Erica, did you bring your chopsticks? Yes, my master. Great detectives have their magnifying glasses. Fruto Erica has her chopsticks. Are you ready? Pour out that sesame salt and use those chopsticks to separate sesame seeds from the salt. Yes, my master. Please watch my fantastic chopstick-wielding skills. 
Yeah, good luck. When you're done, make sure you put everything back in the bag. Are you still bullying her like that? How rude. I'm playing with her. Oh yes, Erica. The mailman just came by with a letter addressed to you. A letter? I sense a crime calling to me. Don't tell me, I'll guess who sent it. The postmark is from heaven. It's probably from Delanor or someone. I'm surprised you're still in touch. Just by the presence of this postmark, see how far Bern Castell's reasoning has taken her. Hey! You can't do that, my master! Van Dyne's knife! It's forbidden to have multiple detectives! Then you'd better get out. So long, great detective Erica. My master, how could you? I'm Erica, witch of truth! I still can't tell if you two like each other or hate each other. Of course we hate each other. You're the only one I love. How could you, my master? Lady Lambda Delta, it looks like there's not enough room for the two of us. Are you serious? Are you challenging the great Lambda Delta? Erica grinned and grabbed Lambda Delta's left arm, which had been walking around the bed. I have here Lady Lambda Delta's arm, and here is a sliced open end of her arm. Erica grinned and wiggled her fingers menacingly. Wait, you aren't thinking... Let's see if my rival can handle this. <laughs> Stop it, that tickles! She tickled the inside of Lambda Delta's left arm. Apparently, she was extremely ticklish there. Incidentally, the open end of Lambda Delta's arm had cute, fluffy white cotton candy poking out. Apparently, her body was made of sweet candy with a bit of spice thrown in. Put your mind at ease, as there is nothing remotely terrifying about this scene. <laughs> Erica ran around, screaming, I defeated Lady Lambda Delta all by myself, just like my master. Lambda Delta growled and hissed at her. Her Castell kept on sewing, an exasperated look on her face. It was a very peaceful scene. So, what does the letter say? Anything about what Dalinor and the others have been up to? Gertrude-san has been promoted to a full Inquisitor or something. Well, good for her. Yay. Oh, in addition to her cat, she's got a Meow Wolf, too. What's a Meow Wolf? What, you don't know? You're so out of touch. They've been all the rage lately. Even I got a female Meow Wolf a few days back. You can make awesome competa with them, too. I'm totally lost, but I'll make sure I stay far away from your homemade food in the future. Cornelia-san is... oh. During an Inquisitor exam, she found she's really good at fighting, so she started combat training. Pretty hard to imagine her doing that, right? Well, there's all kinds of combat training. What's she doing? Looks like kickboxing and Chinese Kenpo. Could that be Ava's influence? I'll bet she'd fight pretty good standing on one leg. Good point. After all, she's been trained pretty well by a certain someone already. It also mentions Wilson. Ah, there's a surprise. Looks like Wilson hit it big on the foreign exchange market. He's now living a life of leisure on the income from his real estate investments. Sounds like he started playing badminton lately, too. I'll bet he has a hellish coach. His butt's probably swollen by now. So what about Delanor? As usual, she's stamping things. Stamping things. Sealing things. Approving things. And sometimes even signing things. She humbly asks us to stir up a crime in her district, since she would get assigned to it personally. Well, why don't we? Crime sounds fun. They say crimes occur wherever the detective goes. One of these days, if I feel like it, I might drop by to bully her. Oh, and there's also something here about the Chester Sister Corps. Wait, I don't want to hear it all at once. You've got to pause a bit for dramatic effect. Okay, that'll do. Ah, I finally grew my right arm back. Do the left one now, please. 
Let's have some tea first. Erica, bring in a can of black tea and a pot of dried plums. Yes, my master. With this particular journey over and done with, the Voyager witches rested their wings. It was all so they could leave on a new journey in search of the next fragment. A short break between trips, backdropped by the pleasant scent of black tea. Where are you going? Where are you going this time? If you go north, I'm heading south. Then if you go east, I'm heading west. And I hope we could find another charming tale like this one. Yeah, this has all just been a Tuesday for them, right? Next time, I hope you aren't playing the villain again, Burn. You do. Being the bad guy was pretty fun. I wonder what kind of tale we'll find next. And what kind of tale we'll meet next meet in? To a pair of lovers, the Sea of Fragments is tiny. Children of Paradise. The Sea of Fragments is pretty huge. Ghost in the Shell. We'll meet again. When something else cries. Sounds good. Let's do that. We will meet again when something else cries. <laughs> yeah, they said the thing. They said the thing. Oh, there's a laugh. The happy voices of the witches faded into the distance. So long, everyone. See you again when something else cries. Now we have the question mark. So that was like kind of the epilogue for some of the meta characters. I wonder what happens next. After Decades It was the largest banquet hall in this huge hotel. The many guests that filled the room chattered and applauded the person receiving an award trophy on top of the stage. The sign in front said, Awards Ceremony from Japan's Greatest Publishers. Now I would like to begin the novel category. The winner is that fantasy adventure novel we all know so well, the story that started a worldwide movement that continues to grow in leaps and bounds. Sakataro's Great Adventure. The projector in front of the audience showed a brief summary of the series. It was a lengthy fantasy adventure novel that was already more than eight installments long. The thrilling fantasy story told the adventures of Sakataro, a cowardly Vegeta lion who makes friends, learns through his experiences, and grows in search of his one fragment. The main character's catchphrase, I'll become the king of the beasts, was even one of the candidates for the buzzwords of the year word. In addition to being a thrill to read, the books also contained many messages for children to learn from earning it high praise as an adventure novel that parents and kids could enjoy reading together. However, it hadn't received such praise from the beginning. For the first six volumes went almost entirely unnoticed. But last year, when the foreign translations of the series began, it got its big break and suddenly became a huge topic of conversation. Even before the series, the author had created quite a lot of works, but none of those achieved any public acclaim. However, after the sudden rise in notoriety, her previous works were being reevaluated one after another. In that sense, it's probably fair to call her an author who went unrecognized for quite a long time. Miss Kotobuki, congratulations on your award! 
Your latest Sakataro goes to the Witch's Island was truly an excellent read. Publishing company executives repeatedly showered her with praise. Sakataro's Great Adventure. The author's name was Kotobuki Yukari. Nearly all her royalties were sent to a fund to support needy children, and she herself had served as the director at several protective institutions. Some envious people tried to call this fake charity, but the more that people learned about her, the more those voices withered and died away. Kotobuki Yukari. By now that name rang loud and clear across Japan. She sat in a chair, cheerfully chatting with people who came to greet her. Last year, she was diagnosed with initial stages of cancer, and after the surgery, her physical strength dropped sharply. Because of this, even in the stand-up awards party, she was given a chair and sat down while greeting people. Some people lamented, saying if only she be had been 20, even 10 years younger, she might have left her mark in history as one of the greatest authors in the 21st century. It had taken so long for her to receive the praise she deserved. She could no longer be called young, even so, her determination to write had not wavered in the slightest. The story had gone around even during her stay in the hospital. Most of her time had been spent typing away. She always said the same thing. That she hadn't finished telling everything she needed to tell. Did she mean she hadn't fully completed Sakataro's great adventure? When that question was asked by a journalist, this is how she answered. If by writing even one more book, I could teach just one more child how to find happiness. Then I will spend the rest of my life writing every book, every page that I can. Because I still haven't fully conveyed the precious teachings I was given. Miss Kotobuki, congratulations on your award! I hear the movie adaptation is getting splendid reviews as well. If you keep this up, you might even pass up Harry Potter's record. Harry the Potato. It was the name of a fantasy series that had become a worldwide hit. Ah yes, Harry Potter, Harry the Potato. Thank you very much for your kind words. It's more than I deserve. Oh, I forgot to tell you. My name is X, head of Company X's first editorial department. Wow, this is this did not age very well, did it? Don't do it. Don't sell your book to Company X. You never know how they'll trample over your work and make it into NFTs and everything, you know? It's an honor to meet you. I hope we have a chance to work together sometime. Actually, Miss Kotobuki, I uh, apologize for being abrupt, but have you heard of the novelist known as Hachijo Toya? Hachijo Toya, you say? She remembered that name from several decades ago. She hadn't expected to ever hear it again. Do you know that name? Have you met Hachijo, by any chance? No, I have not. I did go to visit once, but I was an unknown back then. And since I suddenly barged into the publishing company office, it's hardly surprising I was refused an interview. Oh, I didn't know that. Could it be you're a fan of Hachijo's work? No. I just want to find out what sort of person she was. I see, I see. Well, the truth is, about that novelist, Hachijo Toya would like to meet with you discreetly. To meet with me? Yes. Not as a formal interview, but personally, off the record. If you're interested, we would be happy to arrange the meeting. But of course, this has nothing to do with work. Hachijo Toya wants to meet Kotobuki Yukari. Just like how I realized that Ito Kukuro was Hachijo Toya. Did she use my name to figure out my identity? Hey, Vio Leon, welcome to the stream. Thank you so much for the raid. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for entrusting me with your audience. Thank you for giving the shout out. Please join us in following Vio Leon when you get a chance. Please go check him out and give him all the love. Narak, welcome. Thank you so much for the raid as well. Welcome. Were you two streaming together? Hope you had a good stream. Thank you so much for dropping by. We'll give you a shout out once the cooldown on this one uh, ends. Thank you, thank you. Please go check out Narak as well. Very, very cool streamer. Very kind, very handsome. Please go check him out. Vio, welcome, welcome. I'm Kirill, the Frog Thief Martial Artist. Welcome. We are reading Umineko, uh, and we're at the very, 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 very end of the game, and it is getting very emotional. 
I'm doing really great. Thank you, thank you. Well, thank you for calling Kirby on the stretch, Lork. Yes, please go follow Narek and Vio when you get a chance. And Vio, thank you so much for following me as well. Hope you guys are able to sit back and relax after your long stream. Or go and take care of yourselves as well. I totally, totally understand. Thank you for leaving me, your viewers with me. I appreciate it. And I hope your, hope your raid went... Or, hope your raid. I hope your, <laughs> your stream went well. What were you playing? Oh, thank you for the sleeveless redeem, Sai. And I'm glad you like the stretch animation. Yes. Everyone at home, make sure you... Oh! <laughs> thank you for the frogs, Comfy. Everyone at home, make sure you also take the time to stretch and sit up straight in your seat. You're collabing and playing Biped? That sounds fun! I know that game is like a co-op game. I saw some other people playing it. Looks like a lot of fun. The Rokajima mystery had been called one of the greatest social phenomena at the turn of the century. That uproar, which dragged in enthusiasts from across the world, suddenly subsided after an event held by Hachijo Toya, where she was going to unveil the diary of Ushimiya Eba, which contained the truth. Thank you for giving the shout-out to Narek, too. Though she had set up the event herself, she then outrageously disappeared without releasing the contents of the diary, drawing harsh criticism for doing so. However, a very, very obvious feeling had been revived in the public sphere, that they had been prying into a terrible accident, with many victims purely out of curiosity. And so the frenzy surrounding the Rokujima mystery had faded away quietly. Hachijo Toya. No, Ito Kukuro. She caught the public eye as a forger of Rokujima mysteries. She claimed to have reached the truth and released groundbreaking works of fiction one after another. She became famous as the driving force behind the Rokujima mystery. After realizing that Ito Kukuro was Hachijo Toya, I went to her publishing company to ask for an interview, but I didn't get one. At the time, I despised her. Back in the beginning, I thought she might have used the Rokujima mystery as a publicity stunt to advance herself. But now I feel a bit grateful to her. If she hadn't refused to show the diary in such an outrageous way, the Rokujima cat box might still be the plaything of countless goats. She was indeed a forger who had toyed with the cat box, and I still had an uneasy feeling about her. However, at the same time, she was the one who, practically speaking, allowed Rokujima to rest in peace. And did she really reach the truth? How had she reached something that seemed infinitely close to the truth, even from my perspective? Even now, after all these years, that's something I've wanted to know. What do you think, Miss Kotobuki? Of course, this is not an urgent request. I was told to tell you to take your time and make your decision if you wished. I understand. Does Hachijo Toya live near the city? I was told that a meeting near here would be satisfactory at any time. I see. In that case, can I ask you to arrange a meeting for us in a quiet coffee shop next Sunday? Yes, as you wish. Thank you. Thank you very much. I believe Hachijo will be delighted as well. I have one condition. Yes, whatever you say. I am not going to discuss business, so please refrain from sending anyone from the editing department. But of course, we will do as you say. Madam Hachijo and I will meet alone. Just the two of us. Can I count on you to keep that promise? Well, as to that, we would, um, appreciate it if you kept this quiet, but... What is it? Well, the truth is... The works of Hachijo Toya were written by two people. To the outside world, those books were written by a single female author. But there was actually a second author. A male one. The pair of them asked for a chance to meet you. As soon as I heard that, I felt a premonition. How had Hachijo Toya, a person with no connections to the Ushimi family, managed to write about it in such detail? I was already feeling a premonition of a certain kind of miracle. When I left on my journey, I abandoned the name of Ushimi Ange and stepped into a new life. By now, things have settled down. When the Sumadera family was still a threat, I wanted to distance myself from that name. Thanks to that, no one was able to get in touch with the new me anymore. 
However, now that Sakataro's adventure had caught the public eye this year, and made the name of Kotobuki Yukari famous, maybe it finally reached his ears. I used to play with a stuffed lion animal called Sakataro, along with Mario Nechan. If those who knew this connected the name Sakataro with my name, then it's only natural they figure out who I was. The number of people who would be able to recognize me from this was very, very small. This person was also well versed in detective novels, and a man. I could only think of one person who matched. After all, I knew just how many detective novels he had piled up in his room from the time when his effects were gone through. It was almost the time we arranged for our meeting. My heart was racing, almost like a girl in love for the first time. At the very instant the arranged time came, I heard the sound of the chime on the door, and they appeared. It was a man sitting on a wheelchair, and a woman pushing him. Oh, I thought they were going to keep the CG on the screen for longer. My eyes immediately fixed on the man in the wheelchair. Right away I saw the traces that remained on his face. There's no doubt about it. He's my brother. My brother. Ushimiya Badler. When our eyes met, he gave a little bow. I hurried to my feet and bowed back. It was a somewhat exaggerated and silly way for a pair of siblings to greet each other after several decades apart. He looks like Akihiko from Persona 3, you're right. <laughs> However, my mind was already blank. The miracle I had waited for all this time was now reality. Are you Miss Kotobuki Yukari? Yes, I am. And you two must be Hachijo Toya. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you very much for letting us spoil your precious time today. My name is Hachijo Ikuko. I am mostly in charge of the actual writing. This is Toya. He mostly handles the drafting. Though the woman who called herself Ikuko was far older than me, she seemed to be unbelievably youthful. It wasn't because she was good with makeup or dressed like a younger woman. It feels strange to say it. It was a strange mystique about her, as though she was immortal and never aging. Then I quickly remembered she had introduced my brother as Toya. Pardon me for asking, but are you two married? We are not married, but we have been together for a long time. True. Looking back on it, it really has been a long time. My brother smiled as he spoke. When I learned that, at least for him, those long decades hadn't been a period of isolation and loneliness. I felt an incredible sense of peace and relief. Before I knew it, he was staring back into my face. But I was just six years old the last time we met. It must be hard for him to find any traces he can recognize. However, I'm sure he'll recognize something just the same. We keep stealing glances at each other and looking away, like a couple on a blind date. We were both at an age where outside appearances mattered to us, even though we both knew we wouldn't let our polite exterior falter. This humorous exchange was extremely embarrassing. I thought it would be a fated reunion, that we would hold each other and sob tears of gratitude together. However, reality seemed to be different. But that's fine. It feels like my heart will explode with happiness. Let's take our orders. Is coffee okay? What does everyone want? I prefer something that isn't so bitter. How about you, Miss Kotobuki? Oh, I don't mind. I guess I'll have café au lait. How stiff we're all being. Even my brother seemed to be finding it amusing by now. Well now. When she said that, my brother and I fell silent and sat up straight. Should I start? Or will we start with you, Toya? I'll go first. I'm the one who pushed so hard for this meeting, after all. As he spoke, he watched me calmly. Now, I came here today thinking you might be a certain person. Her name is Ushimiya Ange. When I read your works and heard your name, I was sure you were her. That's right. How long has it been since I last used that name? 
My true name is Ushimiya Ange. I gave the exaggerated bow I'd gotten so used to these long years. We've both aged, haven't we, Oni-chan? I whispered this in my heart. Now it was my turn. With a quick apology, I fished around in my handbag and took out a photo. It was a picture from a trip I'd taken to a amusement park with Battler Oni-chan. I had many other pictures of us having a good time, but this one has the best shot of his face. I looked between him and the photo. There was no longer any room for doubt. Mr. Toya, your true name is... Ushmi Badler's son, isn't it? The hands of the clock inside me stopped. I wanted him to answer with a yes. Even though I was already so sure, I was still about to burst with the tension. And then when that instant seemed far too long-ended, my brother answered. That's right. Uncautiously, I stared at my brother's face. With unbelievable quickness, he acknowledged that he was Ushimi a battler. My eyes immediately filled and overflowed with tears. I took out a handkerchief and wiped them away, but I couldn't hold them back. Oni-chan was alive after all. So why hadn't he come back to me right away? If he had been there during my darkest days, it would have meant so much to me. Normally the thought would have made me curse my brother, but by now even that emotion was softened. After all, now that I was faced with the miracle of being reunited with Oni-chan, everything I felt before fell away with my tears. At this moment, I was happy. I was never alone. I worked so hard for decades with that belief in my heart. Now I've finally been rewarded. By now I couldn't even stop my tears. For some time I continued to sob and sniffle. Watching this, my brother hung his head apologetically. Why hadn't he come back to me sooner? It looked as though he was feeling regret for that. But I'm sure he had some sort of reason. He's probably here to tell me about it and apologize. Already, just by him introducing himself to me today, everything inside of me is washed clean with tears. I'm... sorry. I must be embarrassing you. No. It's only to be expected. For several decades, you've been waiting all alone, believing that your family would return. I did believe. I believed you would come home. Oni-chan. I held out my hand weakly, my brother slowly held out his too. Then I gripped his hand. Regardless of how many long years had passed, it was without a doubt my brother's hand. Once more, I had to struggle to hold back the tears. Aunt Ava avoided the explosion accident by escaping to Kuadorian. How did you escape the accident, Oni-chan? Nisan. On that day, I escaped from the underground passage. The one that goes to Kuadorian. I was told an underground passage led to a hidden mansion on the opposite side of the island. However, the place we escaped to was a submarine base, not Kuadorian. I don't know why my brother entered the underground passage on that day. At any rate, he went into the underground passage, and unlike Aunt Ava, he escaped to the submarine base. There, he escaped the explosion and survived. And after that, I got away on a motorboat. However, it must have capsized somewhere along the way. It must have. Please forgive him. Toya suffers from memory loss. His memory from around the time he was drowning in the ocean is hazy. Could it be he forgot he was Ushimi Badler for a while? That is correct. Yes, that explains nearly all the riddles. My brother escaped from the explosion, but either his boat capsized during his escape from the island, or he fell overboard. Afterwards, he must have drifted somewhere, wandered about half-conscious, and probably got into a traffic accident. On that day, he was lying on the road. If she had found me even a little later, I probably wouldn't have opened my eyes again. I believe you suspected I was the one who hit you for quite some time. Hey, I've already apologized for that. This explains pretty much everything. Either because of the time he nearly drowned, 
or because of the traffic accident. My brother's memory was damaged. His memory probably came back eventually. However, by that time, I already set foot into my new life as Kotobuki Yukari. Only a handful of people, including President Okonogi, knew where I was. Even if my brother wanted to contact me, there was a very good chance he wouldn't be able to. Ironically, the name I abandoned when I decided to live in the future delayed my reunion with my brother for so long. In that sense, I am responsible. I did it to myself. However, I'm sure I received the message my brother sent me. That message was Ito Kukuro. I realized that Ito Kukuro, the forger who claimed to have reached the truth, was actually Hachijo Toya. Then I requested a meeting with her through the publishing company to question her about why she was so sure she'd reached the truth. However, I wasn't granted a meeting. In the end, I heard nothing from them, and it's taken all these decades for me to meet Hachijo Toya. If the publishing company had only passed my message on, we could have been reunited so much sooner. However, at that time, I was just a bourgeois girl who liked to throw money around. Why would they pass on my message when I just barged in with no introduction and claimed to meet the famous and popular Hachijo Toya? We probably crossed paths several times. If just one of those had worked out, if we had been able to meet, just how much would my life have changed? But this was fate. God had decided a few decades was needed before the sibling reunion. And during that time, my brother became one half of a mystery novelist. I became a writer of adventure novels for children. You could say that we achieved success in society. My brother and I were reunited after becoming successful. Now I could do nothing but thank God for bringing about this miracle. Maybe it was God's will we were reunited after achieving success as novelists. Back then I was nameless so I never got through to you. We've met now because we've both become famous as authors. I think all of this was God's will. At the time we heard through the publishing company that you wanted to have an interview with us. They said that a fan who discovered Ito Kukuro's true identity wanted to talk to her. You must have had dozens of fans dying for an interview. You couldn't possibly go to meet all of them. No. They let us know your name was Ushimi Ange. At the time, I'd already realized that Toya's true name was Ushimi Badler, so I thought you should be given a chance to meet him. I refused. My brother said that to me. What did you say? I refused because I didn't want to meet you. Once more, my brother spoke clearly. I was completely confused. I could only sit there in shock and silence, waiting for the words that were sure to follow. I believe I already mentioned that Toya suffered from memory loss. And then, one day... Why'd you refuse if you knew it was me? I cut through Ikuko's words and questioned him directly. What reason could my brother have for rejecting me? I couldn't think of anything. That unpleasant emotion brought up forgotten feelings of anger inside me. You must have known that your little sister was living all alone, being crushed by loneliness. So why? Why did you refuse to meet me? My brother hung his head. It seemed more like he was lost for words than apologetic. There was nothing shy about his appearance, and I questioned him again in an even louder voice. When I asked for an appointment with Hachijo Toya, Ito Kukuro was already famous as a forger. Why did Ito Kukuro's forgeries reach the truth? It's obvious. My brother, Ushimi Badler, explained to her what happened on the island in detail. So the appearance of Ito Kukuro proves that my brother's memory had returned. Therefore, he can't excuse himself by saying he didn't remember me. In fact, in reality, he didn't try to make excuses. On the contrary, he openly said he refused to meet me, even though he knew who I was. Looking back, I regret what I did. You regret it? Did you ever try thinking about how I felt? For decades, for most of my life, did you realize what feelings I had to live with? Various emotions swirled inside of me. I realized that I wasn't in control of them anymore. I could only moan to prevent myself from saying something I'd regret. I feel deeply ashamed for doing something so cruel to you. That's why I searched for you ever since then. For your sake and for mine, I should have met you much earlier. Then why? Why would you meet me then? 
Miss Kotobuki. As I said before, his memory was damaged. No, perhaps I should say his brain was damaged. It's an after effect of the accident. But his memory came back just the same, didn't it? Yes, his memory came back. However, that did not remove the after effects of the damage. I have Ushimi Battler's memories. However, because of the damage to my brain, I can't think of those as my own. I can't think of those as your own. Yes. It's true that my memory of my escape from the island is still hazy. However, I remembered almost everything else. Like how those pink hair ornaments of yours that you treasure so much were something I won for you at the game corner in the abusement park. Yes, that's right. They're a treasure from when I was a child. I still keep them with me in my handbag. I remember a lot more besides that. I remember you giving mom trouble because you hated eating seaweed. I remember that you tried to move it to my plate and trick her. And when... If you remember that much, then why can't you think of those memories as your own? That's the result of the damage to my brain. I've been to several hospitals, but it didn't do any good. You probably can't understand it. You can't know how painful it is to have your mind suddenly filled with the memories of a man you don't know. He was terrified that he wasn't himself anymore. His mind was filled with the memories of a man he didn't recognize, and they threatened to crush and overwhelm him. They must have been his own lost memories. However, his brain couldn't accept those as his own. Those days were painful. Terrifying. It felt like my mind was being invaded. Tonight, when I turn off the lights to go to sleep, maybe I will never wake up again. Maybe a different man will wake up tomorrow morning and start living life in my body. I can't count the nights that this terror tormented me. Several times he tried to convince himself that they were his real memories. He told himself he was Ushimi Badler over and over again. But nothing worked. I am me, Hachijo Toya. No matter how much Ushimi Badler's memories flow into my mind, to be either the memories of another person, I couldn't accept Ushimi Badler. As Ushimi Badler said this, he hung his head and his eyes turned red. And one day, when he was caught between himself and the other self, he couldn't accept. He had a fit. Fortunately, his life was spared, but the after effects forced him to spend his life in a wheelchair. You mean he... Now I know why he showed up in that wheelchair. And now I know why he refused to meet with me. He was afraid that I would call him Big Brother. He was terrified of meeting me, fearful that the part of himself that wasn't him would grow still further in his mind. Like again, this kind of goes also back to Burn Castell's red truth about how everyone from Rokunjima is dead. Ushimi Badler is, quote unquote, dead. Even so, he fought. He felt that since Ushimi Badler was inside him, it was his responsibility to meet you. Thinking that, he kept on fighting in the space between his two selves. And then he had a fit. After something like that, it was only natural that Ikuko would tell him that he didn't need to remember Ushime Badler anymore. Bit by bit, he tried to forget that he was once Ushime Badler. Doctor's instructions and medication. With that and Ikuko's diligent care, he slowly began to regain his peace of mind. Even so, I thought I would have to beat you sooner or later. To be honest, I didn't get a wink of sleep last night. I was scared of meeting you. If I met you, would I die? Yes, I was afraid. However, here I am, talking to you normally. That's why I regret what I did. If only I could have met with you earlier. You and the Ushimi Battler inside of me might not have to suffer for all those years. Just thinking that makes me feel so... sorry. As one who was once Ushimi Battler said this, he broke down crying. I already understood. So it really was true. Ushime Badler did die that day. After all, didn't the witches say he was dead so often with the red truth? Oh, I guess I didn't need to explain that part. <laughs> hey Vibram, welcome to the stream! Thanks for coming by. 
yeah, this totally changes the fact that Hachijo Toya wrote games 3, 4, 5, and 6, right? Was it like a coping mechanism? That would make the most sense, right? How pathetic for the Witch of Resurrection, the Witch of the Future who swore that everyone would always be together. Toya-san, please raise your head. Miss Kotobuki. They realized why I called him Toya-san. By calling him by that name, I myself felt the agitation in my heart subside a little. Thank you. You must have suffered so much. Thank you, Mr. Toya. Ugh. Thank you. Nissan. Thanks for pushing yourself so hard to come here today. Holding hands, we brought our foreheads close and cried together for a while. Then we talked of the old days. He remembered many things vividly, even things that I couldn't remember myself. Each time they made me cry even harder, and he hung his head apologetically. I realized how much this hurt him, so I kept nodding in encouragement with a strange look on my face, something between a sob and a smile. Even if he isn't Ushimi Badler, my Oni-chan came back to me. Welcome home, Oni-chan. Thanks for calling Kirby Lark. It had already gotten dark outside. Even though he had come from far away, he was willing to stay as late as this. We left the store. It's probably best if I don't meet with Mr. Toya again. It will cause him pain. And of course, I'll find myself bound to the past again. Even so, just one more time. There was one place I felt I had to show him. Mr. Toya, would you mind meeting with me just one last time? There's a place I feel I need to show you. Sure, I don't mind. From my handbag, I pulled an invitation written on a folded up piece of A4 paper. The pair of them spread it out. My my, now this looks like a splendid event. Come to think of it, you've been involved in a lot of things besides novels, haven't you? Would you lend me your time just once more on that day? That way I think both me and my brother will be satisfied. I think it might also be a chance for you to free yourself from the weight of my brother's memory, Mr. Toya. I don't believe we had any plans for them, as long as we could finish the afterword for the book. Okay, Miss Kotobuki. We'd be happy to join you. Thank you, Mr. Toya. cold October night was a reminder that winter was approaching. The two people who called themselves Hachijotoya visited the city once again by Ange's invitation. A car stopped in front of a large building. Ikiko unfolded the wheelchair with a practiced hand, lent a shoulder to Toya as he got out of the passenger seat, and helped him into the chair. It looks splendid. The Fukuin House. It's my first time coming here, but... I know it well. I believe it's the institution for children that was funded by the Ushimi family. Madam Ikuko, Mr. Toya, allow us to welcome you to the Fukuin house. They were welcomed by Ange and some staff members. This was the Fukuin house, a welfare institution for unfortunate children who had lost their parents. In the past, this institution had been established thanks to Ushime Kinzo's support. However, that support had been interrupted and the Fukuin house had been forced to shut down for a time. Decades passed, and now the institution would be revived. Revived by the hand of Kotobuki Yukari. It's a pleasure to see you again, Miss Kotobuki. Thank you for inviting us. The two of us want you to have this. It's not much, but I hope the children will enjoy it. It's not the reason I invited you here. My apologies. Don't worry about that. The tales of the future are always woven by children. After all, without them, the tales of humans will not continue. Children are treasures, so please let this be useful. Thank you very much. We have a form for donations, so if it isn't too much trouble. The Fukuin House have been drastically remodeled in recent years. 
in the hopes that children would one day be able to remember this as a fun place. And she used her own memory, or her own money, to massively remodel it into a beautiful establishment. But now she had accumulated a lot of wealth as a novelist. But even without saying that, she had been saving the tens of millions of yen she got from the Ushime group each year under the name of Living Expenses. This money had been used generously to help the children. When they came into the entrance hall, a cheerful scene was spread before them. They were pictures and crafts created by the children. Every corner was filled with things on display. The contrast between this elegant building and the school atmosphere was amusing. The yells and laughter of kids running around drifted in from the distance. I imagine many of the children come here hanging their heads in sorrow, to think they could laugh like that. You really have done something great. Anyone can use magic to create a future and find their fragments of happiness. This is a witch's school for teaching that magic. The witch dormitory from Sakataro's Great Adventure. Oh, how embarrassing. So you read it too. We read straight through it right after our last meeting. I really must bow my head, not only to your talent as a writer, but to your warm heart. How embarrassing. This way, straight to the end. Pushing Toya's wheelchair, we advanced through the corridor and reached the great doors at the end. The happy voices of children came from the other side. Apparently this was where tonight's party was being held. There were several jack-o'-lanterns cut out of origami. Tonight was the Fukuin House's Halloween party. Here you are, Mr. Toya. I see, so it's trick-or-treat. He was handed a bag filled with candy. A teacher warned him in a small voice to watch out for rampaging children. Children. I haven't had anything to do with them for years. Please tell the children stories of dreams. All of us welcome guests here. That's tricky. What should I tell them? When you're handing in your manuscript, choose your publishing company wisely. Don't pay any attention to reader polls. <laughs> then I'll open the doors. The children are waiting. Ange opened the large double doors. This is... At the sight of the hall, Toya opened his mouth in wide-eyed shock. This was the great hall of the Ushimiya Manor. No, that's impossible. This is definitely the Fukuin House. But its hall was just like the one in the Rokunjima Mansion. What a splendid hall. This is a replica of the hall in the Ushimiya Mansion on Rokunjima. Yes. I've reproduced it as well as my memory would let me. The details might be wrong, though. No. This really is the hall of the Ushimiya family mansion on that day. And then Toya's eyes fixed on something at the other side of the room. It was a portrait. A portrait of Rokunjima's other master. It's exactly the same as my memories. The artist hired by Ushimi Kinzo to paint the portrait had a photo. I had him draw it again based on that. I was simply frozen in shock. The long, large table was filled with Halloween party food and surrounded with children stuffing themselves. The teacher said, Everyone, we have guests! The children all looked back at us at once, then stood up and ran forward. Their broad smiles at the arrival of this long-awaited guest enveloped me. Their smiles and eyes of the children welcomed me. Yeah, I know. I know all your faces. It's been so long. Far too long. I'm finally here at last. Welcome home, sir. You took your time. We have been waiting you. Welcome home, battler. Welcome home. You seem well. Badler kun Oh, you're looking well. Welcome home. Here you. Welcome home, Badler. Uh, we've been waiting for you. Oh, Badler san. The guest of honor has finally arrived. Welcome home, sir. Welcome home, sir. Lord Badler. Welcome home, Badler sama. 
Welcome home. Hey, took your time, Battler. You kept us waiting too long. We've been waiting, Battler Kun. So you're finally here. We have been waiting. Welcome home, Lord Battler. We salute you, Lord Battler. You came. Congratulations. Oni-chan, welcome home. You've kept me waiting, battler. Sorry, I showed up pretty late. What are you doing sitting in a wheelchair like that? Come on! I'll give you a hand, so straighten up. Ito stepped forward and held out a hand to Badler. As he sat in the wheelchair, Badler slowly grasped that hand and rose to his feet. I... Listen, all of us are finally here. Tonight, the Golden Land will be resurrected in this place. An explosive applause greeted Badler. Everyone was there. Everyone. 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 Then Bito hugged Badler, strongly, tightly, as though she would never let him go. It is truly amazing that you made it back. I'm home. Sorry I took so long. I won't let go again. Yeah, I'm not letting go either. We'll be together for all eternity. We finally made it to the Golden Land. Oh. 
And there we have it. I'm trying so hard not to like tear up during those last couple lines. <laughs> I offer up this tale to my beloved witch, Beatrice. Okay, ooh, 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 so many thoughts. Before we go into a little, like, summary and explanation, uh, I want to go into the tips menu just to see what was added there. Oh, we have the music box. So episode 8 tips. Pretty sure the humans are pretty much all unchanged. I guess this part didn't change much either, actually, since the last time we checked, like, last stream. Look at the music box. I probably won't play it, just in case I... play some, like, music that gets me blocked or whatever, because some of the openings do get blocked on on Twitch. Yeah, there's a bunch of them. You know, the cool thing is that if you go to the Umaneko wiki and look up each individual episode, there's a page for each episode called Summary, and it basically just summarizes the main plot points that happen. It's a little bit incomplete for the answers arc, but it's all still there. And for each scene, it, it tells you the name of the music track that plays during that scene. Oh, I like how there's a skip scary tunes, or play scary tunes only mode. But if you're like ever curious about a music that plays during like a specific scene, if you go to that wiki, just open it up, go to the episode, click on the summary page, scroll down to the part where you're looking for, and it will tell you right there which track plays during that part. It's actually really nice. People spent a lot of time putting that together. Oh, okay. Wow. Boom and echo. We've been... Here, I've, I, even, I even wrote some notes, so I don't forget what to say. If I counted correctly, that's 42 streams. After this, it will be spread across 49 videos on YouTube, and 151 hours total. So it's been a long journey over these last... 10 or so months, and I'm really, really glad that we got to it, and that you guys really got into it, and that we finished it <laughs> as well. Um, it is a lot of reading, that's why we did it once a week, but it was really fun, because I really enjoyed this story. I really love Umineko, but not very many people know about it, or they only know about it in passing, or they only watch the anime. So to get like the full breadth of it, uh, it was nice being able to share it. Especially since using the 7th mod to replace all the artwork with the, the PS3 artwork, because... The Steam artwork, although also known as the Manga Gamer artwork, is not as good. And there is something charming about the original artwork, but let's be honest. This artwork looks pretty good. So, I'm going to start by summarizing the entire story in as quick as I can, in a way that makes sense, and then explain a little bit. I'm not going to go over like every single mystery that, like, like, for example, that Willard does, but I'll give you like a couple of the major points that basically lead you to solve everything yourself. And again, if you go to the Umineko wiki, each individual episode has a solutions page. And you can go in there, and they're, they're kind of incomplete for some of the episodes, but they actually break down each episode, the mysteries, the murders, the locked rooms, and basically how they're done. So, basically, as we know, the history of the Ushimiya family the Ushimiyas lost most of their wealth in the Kanto earthquake of 1923. Kinzo was from a branch family. He was made the head as a puppet. He had an arranged marriage where he had some children. And he went to be stationed at Rokunjima during World War II because he wanted to die. That's where he met Beatrice Castiglioni, the Italian. 
and they came in a submarine full of all the gold, just like in Episode 7. After a fight over the gold, only Kinzo and Beatrice were left. He spirited Beatrice away, hid her away. He used the gold to revive the family. And during that time, he had a child with Beatrice, who had a striking resemblance to Beatrice herself. After Be Beatrice, and he hid that child away in Kuadorian. Because remember, he bought Rokunjima and built the, the mansion there. And Beatrice Castiglione passes away. Kinzo thinks that his daughter, Beatrice, Kuadorian Beatrice, is the reincarnation of her mother. And he can't unsee that and can't control himself. He gives in to his urges and he basically rapes her or engages in incest with her. Sometime later, Rosa stumbles across Kuadorian as a child and meets the Kuadorian Beatrice and takes her on a little adventure to see outside the mansion. Beatrice slips and falls down a cliff and dies. Rosa runs back, tells Genji about it. Genji goes back to the body and recovers the child who was at the time unborn. And Genji tries giving the child to, or Genji and Kinzo try giving the child to Natsuhi to raise as her own because she's having trouble having her own child. Natsuhi doesn't like that, and one day when there's a servant walking around with that baby outside, Natsuhi pushes the servant off a cliff, and that servant and that baby presumably die. Genji goes, recovers the baby's body, baby's still alive, Nanjo and Genji help the baby, bring the baby to Fukuin house and create a new identity for the baby. So this baby, this granddaughter of of Beatrice Castiglione and Kinzo um, is named Sayo Yasuda. And I've mentioned this before, but Yasuda is, or Yasu is kind of synonymous with the Japanese word for culprit because there was like an older mystery novel that everyone knows the culprit is Yasu. And it's kind of like everyone knowing that Darth Vader is Luke Skywalker's dad. So Everyone knows that Yasu is the culprit, so that's why they named them Yasu, so that when people try to Google who the culprit was, it might be a little bit harder, because it just comes up with the word culprit, basically. So, Sayo Yasuda is raised at the Fukuin house, and one day comes to work at the Ushimir mansion under the guise, or under the recommendation of Genji. And Genji lies about Yasuda's age, so that people don't immediately put together that Yasuda is the Beatrice's granddaughter. So Yasuda starts to work at the Rokunjima Island. Kinzo doesn't know about Yasuda at this point. However, Genji, Nanjo, and Kumasawa do. And Genji is like a father figure to Yasu, and Kumasawa is like a mother figure to Yasu. And Yasu has a very overactive imagination, uh, kind of as a coping mechanism. So Yasu has an imaginary friend, Shannon, who Yasu envisions as being the perfect servant. Shannon is what Yasu aspires to be. Yasu also suffers from gender dysphoria and is implied to perhaps be intersex or some kind of non-binary, probably because of the incest from Kinzo and Kuadori and Beatrice. So Yasu has this gender dysphoria and along with like low self-confidence and a bunch of other things, Yasu falls in love with Badler because they both have this shared love of mystery novels, although at the time this is Yasu under the guise of Shannon. Because Yasu already has the idea of Beatrice as the ghost of the island, and then Badler decides not to come back to the island because he gets into a fight with Rudolph since Rudolph remarried Kyrie after Asumu died, Badler not knowing that Kyrie is actually his biological mother, which makes him Ange's biological brother and not half-brother. So Badler leaves the island, and Yasu can't deal with the loss of Badler, and puts their love of Badler into their Beatrice persona. Also, because to deal with the gender dysphoria, Yasu creates the character of Canon so that Yasu can act out as a boy, 
Now keep in mind, we keep seeing Shannon and Cannon together, but they mentioned this very offhandedly during the first game. Shannon and Cannon don't normally work on the same day at Rokunjima at the same time. That is very unusual that they both work at the same time. The family conference that year was an exception. And that is such a glanced over sentence, but it makes things feel a lot... It makes a little bit more sense when you think about it. But again, Genji, Kumasawa, and Dr. Nanjo know about this. And no one else does. Like, Goda doesn't know, for example. Kinzo doesn't know, for example. Yet. Eventually, Yasu solves the epitaph with a little bit of help from Genji. And Kinzo finds out that Yasu is actually his granddaughter. And he apologizes to his granddaughter for what he did to Beatrice. Knowing that it's not really them, but he kind of still sees Beatrice in them. And then Kinzo dies. And... Yasu learns the truth about their circumstances of birth from Genji, Nanjo, and Kumasawa. They all, Yasu also learns that they cannot bear children because of their body, because of their intersex or non-binary nature. So then Yasu starts to call themselves furniture, seeing themselves as less than human and unable to love. Eventually, their Shannon persona falls in love with George, and their Canon persona falls in love with Jessica. And Yasu also becomes friends with Maria as well, and they make imaginary characters together in their free time. Yasu also decides to let to not take the wealth of the Ushimiya family, despite now being the head, and tells them to operate it as normal. So um, they so Kraus and Natsuhi are still acting like as if Kinzo's alive because they don't want his death to come out so that they have the inheritance problem from their siblings. So eventually, Yasu is so torn about who they love, George or Jessica. And of course, they feel pressure because of George mentions things like wanting to have kids, for example, and Yasu can't do that. Eventually, Badler returns, and suddenly Yasu is torn between Badler and George and Jessica at the same time. So Yasu decides to create this demon roulette of the Rokunjima massacre to determine their fate, because we keep talking about how magic is determined by the risk involved, right? And so their goal of the roulette is either remind Badler about their love of mystery, their shared love of mystery novels together, and that he made the promise to Shannon about mystery novels, and remember his promise and fall back in love with them, and solve the epitaph, or kill everyone else in the process, trying, or maybe end up with George or Jessica either, right? It's kind of this weird cat box, this is where the cat box comes in. So Yasu, like, comes up with a bunch of different contingency plans, and at least two of them end up in bottles that they throw into the ocean, which become the writings for episode one and episode two. Now, this is where I explain the Catbox rules, because the Catbox rules are kind of important to this. So, in this visual, in the visual novel version of the game, I'm going to be very specific, in the visual novel version of the game, the game kind of is unclear about which version of the Catbox plays out. In the manga, that's not quite the same, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Basically, the way the Catbox works, the way the Rokunjima massacres work, as they are written in the game, so the culprit is always Yasu as acting as Shannon and Canon. Notice how in pretty much every game, whenever Canon dies, something happens to his body where it can't be recovered or disappears. And that is linked to the fact that Shannon and Canon are the same person. Now, you might be wondering, well, we've seen Shannon and Canon together at the same time, so how can that be possible? That comes into one of the other rules of the cat box. So the other rule of the cat box is that all lies that all parties agree upon are depicted as reality. So if you're in a room with everyone who's in on a secret, anything can happen as long as they all agree to it. So in scenes where we see Shannon and Cannon together is never in front of Badler, who is the detective for episodes 1, 2, 3, and 4, and Erica in episodes 5 and 6. Never at any point is Badler 
in the same room as Shannon and Cannon. The time that it happens is always when they're among servants such as themselves, like Genji, Nanjo, and Kumasawa, or other people that are in on the secret at that point in time. Now, the other rule is that if one of the parties in the room dies, then dead man tell no tales, right? So their perspective could also be warped as well. So if in, in the game, they represent this with golden butterflies, all the people that are working with the culprit or just about to die can see the golden butterflies and the illusions. People who are not bought off, people who are not working with the culprit, will see the butterflies 30 minutes before their death as a way of storytelling. So anytime there's like fantastical stuff happening in Umaneko, it's because everyone that's present at the time in the real world, not the meta world, has agreed that that's what the fiction is going to be or is about to die so their opinion doesn't really matter. So like a good example would be in game one, Canon comes like... Ava and Hideyoshi are killed in their room. Cannon comes with Genji, and they say, the room is bolted from the inside. We can't unlock it. Cannon goes and gets the bolt cutters, cuts the room open, and opens it, and everyone wonders, how is this a locked room? Because it was bolted from the inside. The solution is, it was never bolted at all. Cannon and Genji had already broken into it, and then agreed to tell the story that the lock was broken. So, in the narrative, we get an unreliable narrator that shows us that it was locked. Does that make sense? So almost all the locked rooms can be solved by either a Shannon Cannon scenario, where they're both the same person and switching between their personas, or because everyone witnessing a certain event is lying about the same thing, because that is their shared truth. Confusing yet? Um... So, in all the games, Yasu is the culprit as Shannon and Cannon. Every single time in every game, Genji, Kumisawa, and Nanjo, and Maria are on to them. In some way or form. Although, I would... people usually kind of... It is, it's not said as this directly, but it's kind of said... indirectly. But out of all those people, Genji's probably the only one that actually knows the full extent of Yasu's murder-suicide plan and goes along with it because of guilt of how Yasu has lived their life and his loyalty to Kinzo. Kumasawa and Nanjo know about Yasu and Shannon and Cannon, but they're probably not in on the entire plan. They probably don't know that everyone's actually going to die. Although, personally, I found it really hard to believe that Kumasawa would be lying because, you know, every time they get into a near-death situation, she's, like, panicking and screaming, which is understandable for an old lady, you know, trapped on an island where everyone's getting murdered. But remember in episode 5, they keep saying that Kumasawa's a really good actress because she fools everyone into thinking that, that Kinzo's still alive at one point? So then I'm like, oh man, maybe she's just really crafty, but I I'm sure she definitely felt real terror at some of these things. Don't get me wrong. And then Maria is a common accomplice because... Beatrice needs to give the letter to Maria to read at the dinner table. And Maria, the way she sees the world is she reads people based on their personality, not by their appearance, right? That's why when Rosa's angry, she calls her the Black Witch. So when Shannon wants to become Beatrice in front of, of Maria, Shannon does not require a wig and a costume. Because all Shannon needs to do is act like a different person with a different personality and maybe a different voice, and Maria will see that person as Beatrice and not as Shannon, so Shannon doesn't need to go change into an outfit every time she wants to talk to Maria. However, there are times where Shannon does dress up like Beatrice to fool people, like briefly in episode 2 where she dresses up as Beatrice and walks through the foyer with Genji so that Kyrie catches a glimpse of them so that she can go tell everyone else. But that's besides the point. Um, so... Yasu's the culprit, with Genji, Kumasawa, Nanjo, and Maria as common accomplices in each game. The last rule is that in each episode, there's a different conspirator that works together with Yasu. These conspirators are always a couple of the adult Ushiomiyas, because all the adult Ushiomiyas are very easy to buy off with money, and Yasu has all the gold on the island. So in each game, there's what we what people call the culprit roulette. So in episode one, Ava and Hideyoshi are actually cooperating 
with Yasu because Hideyoshi tells George not to look at Shannon's corpse because he wouldn't want to see that and actually prevents him from seeing it because either Shannon's corpse isn't actually there or because he's hiding the fact that Shannon's actually lying there alive before she sneaks off and changes into canon. So in episode one, Ava and Hideyoshi have been bought off and they're actually working with Yasu, which which uh, kind of goes against them because eventually Yasu kills them for the second Twilight anyways. In episode two, Rosa is the one being bought off instead, which is how Rosa is able to deliver the letter from Maria to everyone at the dinner table. And Goda also does one lie during episode two, so he could have been bought off or coerced in some way with Rosa. In episode three, Ava and Hideyoshi are again the culprit that the culprits that work with Yasu. In episode four, it's an interesting case because everyone except for Badler has been bought off, which is kind of unlikely but possible, I guess. Remember, episodes three and four were written by Toya, right? So, like, Badler, in episode four, everyone except for Badler has been bought off because remember, everyone's getting killed by the Chester troops as they run away from Kuadorian, and then Kyrie picks up the phone and says, Badler. If, if you see demons or something like that, remember that they're real, right? Like, right before she dies. Like, everyone's kind of in on it. Which is why when Kinzo summons all the demons inside the dining hall, that story technically works, because everyone in the room was bought off and agreed to make up the story about Kinzo summoning demons and murdering everyone. In episode 5, everyone is bought off except for Natsuhi and Erika, because Erika is the detective in that one, instead of Badler. And Natsuhi is the one they're trying to pin the crime on. Because um, in episode 5, the whole story was they were trying to get Natsuhi to confess to Kinzo still being alive. That's why Ronov says that ep in episode 5, the game has no love. Because Badler in that game has also been bought off and is working with the culprit. Which is how Badler is able to, perform who do to make his theory about the man from 19 years ago. So that's why he says that is a game with no love because Beatrice would never buy off Badler in her game. Because the whole point of her game is to make Badler see the truth behind their old promise. So it wouldn't make sense for her to buy him off. Yeah, so like even when like, even when we see the goats and stuff, it's because everyone in the room is either agreeing to the story or about to die. Like at the end of episode 2 when Badler gets naked and gets the leash and Beatrice drags him into the, the foyer with the goat party. It's because Badler's right about to die so he can see the illusions, because his opinion doesn't matter, because he's about to die. Um, so basically, the whole point of of Yasu's plot is she wins by either killing everyone or losing by having their mystery solved. Either outcome is something they desire, because they're leaving it to fate. So, episodes 1 and 2 are written by Yasu, and episodes 3, 4, 5, and 6 are written by Hachijo Toya which is Featherine and Badler from the future, who are writing forgeries and Badler coping with his memory loss about this other self he has inside himself as well. All of this kind of makes more sense if you consider the episode 5, no, episode 6, The Trial of Love. Beatrice and Badler, George and Shannon, Jessica and Cannon fight it out to decide who gets the miracle of love. The reason being, they say, because Shannon and Cannon and Beatrice are all furniture. They're not real people, and they only have enough for one miracle. That's because Beatrice, Shannon, and Cannon are all the same person. So that's why they need to have this trial of love. And Shannon wins in the end because she accepts George's proposal. Meanwhile, Badler gets caught in a logic error and is disqualified because he knows that he should love Beatrice, but he forgets why. He loses the reason why he even made the promise in the first place because of his memory loss. He's trapped in a logic error. It's all an allegory for the entire triangle of love, I guess you could say. Now, in the visual novel, it's kind of left a little bit vague what actually happens on Rokunjima. It's a cat box. All we know is that in Anja's future, Ava survives and later Badler survives. Now, the manga makes it very, very clear that what happened on Rokunjima, in reality, the real truth, 
is the episode 7 tea party. The reality is all the adults came together, solved the epitaph, and then Kyrie and Rudolph went around killing everyone. And then narrowly missed killing Ava, who killed them back in retaliation and was able to escape. That, in the manga, is revealed as directly being what happened. So some people people were arguing online about, well, that's the manga, that's a different interpretation, it's a different possibility. The visual novel's different, so so in the visual novel we still don't know exactly what happened. So I think after a bit of arguing, Ryokishi finally kind of came forward and was like, no, the manga's canon. The manga is a retelling of the visual novel. Everything in the manga is canon. And that kind of quashed those theories at the time. In fact, when episode 7 kind of reveals that Yasu exists, a lot of people thought, no way, Ryukishi wouldn't tell us that. That's too easy. This is a red herring. And so there were a lot of other culprit theories going around. Like, for example, the Rosa culprit theory was people were actually able to come up with an entire theory that worked with Rosa being the culprit. And then other people were like, no, we think there's Ava. And people actually crafted an entire story explanation of how Ava could have done all those murders. And then the manga, again, directly shows Yasu doing it come episode 7. So then Ryukishi had to say, no, no, I didn't I didn't trick you guys. It it wasn't a red herring. It was actually it was actually Yasu. Yeah, the, the idea of the catwalks is really nice. And so in the in the Ange future, right? All the adults banded together, saw the epitaph, got the gold, greedily started fighting with each other. Rudolph and Kyrie killed everyone except for Rosa. Which means in that future, in that timeline, Beatrice did not commit any murders herself. We just saw that Beatrice actually survived, and she warned Badler about these murders, and they escaped to the underground submarine base while Ava escaped to Kuadorian. Badler and Beatrice got on a boat, and that's why Badler says, like, oh, but you didn't kill anyone, and Beatrice says, well, I did in other realities. So he spears her away, Beatrice, and also, I think it's, I didn't realize this when I first read it, but seeing here now, the fact that Badler throws away his jacket is very significant, because his, his jacket also has the Ushimiya family crest on it, so the fact that he throws it away, would, which also means that he's not identifiable as being an Ushimiya after he throws the jacket away, Beatrice, feeling guilt over all this, commits suicide. She ties herself to the golden ingot and throws herself over the edge of the water. Badler dives in after her, trying to save her. Badler suffers from drowning and a bunch of memory loss. And so we see in the in the fantasy world, like a part of Badler died there with Beatrice and then a part of Badler ascended up to the surface. Presumably ended up on land, got into a traffic accident, was picked up by Hachijo Ikugo, who nursed him back to health and was a mystery novelist. Eventually, the Rokenjima craze kind of catches on, and Badler hears about it, or Hachijo Toya hears about it, and starts piecing together his memories and then writing these mysteries to cope with it as well. Yeah, it, it, it could also be played out that he imagined Beatrice being there, but I think the manga makes it a bit more clear that Beatrice actually escaped with Badler. He remembered that he loved Shannon, or Beatrice, or Yasu, in that timeline, and then Beatrice killed herself, and then Badler got brain damage. So then Ange grows up lonely with only the company of Maria's diary, and an estranged relationship with Ava, and so she's searching for the truth, and at one point she's about to jump off the building. Now at this point, Ange's story kind of splinters off into like multiple realities. So in one reality, she jumps off the building, she survives, she meets Amakusa, runs away from the from the Sumadera family, ends up on Rokunjima, and then gets confronted by Kasumi, which and then Kasumi and her goons start dying off. In another reality, she jumps, she lives, she runs off with Amakusa, she meets Hachijo Toya, the female, the featherine, before she goes to Rokunjima. In the trick ending, we see that on their way to Rokunjima, she discovers that Amakusa's planning to kill her, so she kills him and Captain Kawabata and avoids that fate while rejecting magic and becoming like Erika. In the reality that we follow, 
she doesn't jump at all. She gives ownership of the company to Otonogi and thereby avoids that entire scenario where everyone's trying to kill her and then retires as the author, tries to meet Toya at some point, fails to, and then eventually meets Toya and Ikugo for real at the end and then brings them to the Fukuin house where Toya can finally put his memories of Balor to rest. Balor is finally able to go rejoin the Golden Land because remember, the whole point of Beatrice's games were to make Balor believe in magic so he could go to the Golden Land and everyone would be going to the Golden Land because they're all waiting for him there. So the real reason for that is because they were trying to make Badler accept his death as Badler at that point. Yeah, it's like it's such a I was expecting like more of a bittersweet ending, and it kinda is in some ways, but it is like a sweet ending too at the same time. And like I love the idea of the cat box, how they're able to craft so many different like things with it as well, which is really cool. Like the whole idea of cat box in fiction, I think, is personally something I lean a lot towards. Like for example, you know, you have multiple ships in a series you like, right? You don't know which one's canon. It's kind of nice when none of them are canon because then everyone can have their own fun, right? It's a cat box. Now, if you like Umineko, there's actually still a lot of extra content you can consume, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of that stuff right now. So, there are a bunch of Umineko side stories that were not officially translated to English, but have been fan translated, which shed new light on certain characters and give us little bits of... Um, story so and then they were compiled in different versions of umineko so in umineko no naku koroni subasa they compile a bunch of the side stories which include letter from burn castell the witch's tanabata isn't sweet game master battler jessica's mother's day present jessica and the love charm memoirs of the lambda delta Notes from a certain chef. That one actually stars Goda. <laughs> Labor Thanksgiving Day gifts. The Seven Sisters Valentine. Beatrice's White Day. Cornelia the New Priest. Who's Tea Party? To Mount Purgatory Sakataro. And Arigato for 556. Chester 556 is a Chester sister that only appears in the side story because she's was destroyed by Rosa, or her her doll was smashed by Rosa. Then, when Umineko no Nakukoro ni Hane came, came out, they added two more side stories. One is called Jessica and the Killer Electric Fan, which is a very interesting name. And there's another one called Forgery Number XXX. And that forgery goes o that story goes over the the Battler family culprit theory that we saw during Burn Castell's game. And some of that is actually used in the fighting game, Golden Fantasia. Then, the, right now, the most final compilation of Umineko is called Umineko no Naku Koroni Saku. That one actually has its own opening theme. It was also ported to PS4 and Switch in Japan, and that was also given its own opening theme. It has one group called, one side story called Our Confession written by Yasu that kind of goes over the rules of the cat box. And there's another one called The Last Note of the Golden Witch. And I've heard that one, people have referred to that one as episode 9 before, but it's an extra story that kind of adds a couple extra characters, or one extra character, and gives another proposes another mystery upon Battler and Beatrice and Ange. And the PS4 and the Switch version of the game is also called Symphony of Catbox and Dreams. Yeah, so like, if 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 Ange believes in magic, it leads to the magic ending where she eventually runs into Badler when he's older. If she only if she doesn't believe in magic, then it's a trick. She ends up killing Amakusa and Kuabata, and then who knows what happens after that. So officially, there is one Umineko spin-off, Golden Fantasia, also known as Ugon Ogon Musokyoku in Japanese. It's a fighting game. And we will be playing it on stream, but I'll probably wait a while before we do it, because <laughs> I think I need a break from Uneko. And also, it's a it's a hard fighting game. It's actually really fun, but it's really hard, and also like only Uneko people would actually understand what's going on in it. But it's really it's a real treat, and I'll have a lot of fun explaining all the the ways the visual novel mechanics are carried over into the fighting game, because it's actually really really cool. 
there's actually a couple fan games as well. There's a fan game called Rosa Muso, because at the end of episode 2, we saw Rosa killing a whole bunch of goats. And, like, you know, in, like, in Muso games, like Dynasty Wars and Samurai Wars, you're a fighter who takes down, like, hundreds and hundreds of armies of people. So it's the idea of Rus Rosa is in a Muso game. It's like a side-scroller, you play as Rosa, and you're basically mowing down hundreds of goats that keep coming at you, and sometimes the Seven Sisters of Purgatory. It's kind of like, you can tell it's fan-made because it's not like super finesse, but it looks hilarious. If you look up Rosa Muso, you'll find tons of videos about it. There's another fan game that I saw that I need to talk about. It's called Umineko Action, Action Game of the Golden Witch. And I haven't really been able to find real, a real download for it. It's in Japanese, of course or like a real gameplay video, but if you search up Umineko Action, there is one person who posted like a like a trailer for the game, it's like a three minute trailer, that actually goes over it really really well, and it's just fun to watch just the trailer. In the action game, it's a platformer, it's a side-scroller, you could play as Badler, Jessica, George, Rosa, Ange, Cannon, Will, Erica, or Amakusa, and each of them has their own like special abilities, like Amakusa can shoot his gun, Rosa can like shoot a bunch of guns at once with Maria, Ange can like double jump or something like that. Um, Badler can like shoot his blue truths. Jessica can turn into her Toho cosplay and fire off a bunch of music notes. It's actually pretty cool. And there's actually boss fights against, in the trailer, you see boss fights against Virgilia, Delanor, Beatrice, Gop. It's actually really creative in the way that they've taken that and turned it into like, um, you know. Like an actual thing. It's, it's it's hilarious. Yeah. Oh, you're thinking of Last Note of the Golden Witch? I mean, people probably translate it differently because it's a fan translation. That's the one that also has Virgilius in it at the very end. Virgilius was a scrapped character that was supposed to be Virgilia and also kind of like Erica, but then they scrapped Virgilius. Um, yeah, the, the lore goes pretty deep. And the cool thing about all these side stories is that... On the Umineko wiki, I think they have translated like transcripts of them. So if you're really interested, you can just read through them without like obviously hearing the music and seeing the portraits and whatnot. But it's kind of cool if you're really deep into the Umineko lore. There's a lot to unpack here. As for Umineko itself, like man, I love it. <laughs> I love the murder mystery genre. I love the fantasy spin on it. I love the wacky rules. I love the characters. The music was fantastic, of course. I love how multi-dimensional the characters were. Like, there's so many characters where you hate them one second, then you like them another second, you feel bad for them another second. Especially the Ushimiya aunts, especially. It's a bit too bad that Hideyoshi didn't get much time at all, despite being, like, integral to some of the plots. Also, Rudolph and Kyrie didn't get that much screen time compared to most of the others. Rudolph probably even less so than Kyrie, even though, again, they have a pretty big role in it. Honest, uh, like, of course, Goda doesn't have much of a role, he's just comic relief, but even like Genji and Nanjo and Kumasawa play a big role in the story, but they don't get much screen time. Although Virgilia and Ronov get screen time, so it kind of, because Ronov is technically Genji and Virgilia is for Kumasawa, so you get some of that. But like, you get stuff like, you know, Rosa seems like the cool aunt, and you see her domestically abusing Maria, and then you see her defending Maria against an army of goats, and you're like, okay, I don't know how to feel about you, I hated you, and then now I think you're kind of cool, and then you see her killing Sakataro, and you're like, well, now you're now you're dead to me, and then you see you're fighting Erika at the end, and you're like, actually, you're kind of cool again. Like, it's like, what do I know? Same with, like, Natsu. You see, you feel, like, bad for her in the first episode, and then you see, like, you know, you find out that she killed a child, and then you're like, oh, I shouldn't feel bad for you, and then you see her getting reamed by the entire family in episode 5, and you're like, maybe I do feel bad for you. Even Ava, right? She seems, like, you know, not very pleasant, and then you find out other sides of her that are like, actually, you might be kind of a good person. So, yeah. I think the, the neatest thing is because the entire, like, story, of course, is being told by these characters that are able to in the future. So, like, Beatrice created the story, so she can have a role in the metaverse. Badler lives to tell the tale, and so does Ava, and that's why they get meta versions of themselves, too. Badler gets, well, Badler, and then Ava, we get Ava Beatrice. Ange lives on to the future, so she can tell the story, and Featherine is able to tell the story because she is able to rewrite the story herself with Hachijo Toya, right? So, like, the entire frame of the narrative is also something that's kind of, you know, unreliable. For example, um, like, episode 7 Tea Party is so interesting to me because 
This whole time, we've kind of been seeing this whole game as some kind of elegant, elaborate mystery novel where there's closed rooms and everyone's been... All the murders have been carefully planned. And then come episode 7, you realize maybe this was just a massacre by two greedy people going around and just mowing everyone down for money. All the elegance... Elegance, in quotation marks, is suddenly lost and it leaves this taste in your mouth. And then, like, Will comes and says that couldn't happen because there's no evidence of Kyrie and Rudolph ever having been culprits. Which technically he's right by saying that if you follow Van Dyne's rules. But maybe the fact that no clues were ever shown about Rudolph and Kyrie being culprits is because the story is being told from the point of view from Badler and Ange and Ava, right? So there's so many different ways that you can interpret a lot of these events from different perspectives and depending on when you think about who's writing this, right? Which is really, really cool. Even all the meta characters coming in and out eventually end up, you know, mostly on our side, except for Erica and, and Burn. But even they had a lot of, like, moments where you're like, oh, this ter character's kind of terrible. And it's like, oh, actually, they're kind of cool, right? Seeing everyone hang out at the Halloween party is kind of cool. It's just such an emotional roller coaster. I only wish, my only, like, thing about Umineko is that I wish that it was so long, because that makes it really hard for other people to get into. It's so hard to convince someone else to get into it when they know it's so long, and reading through it the second time has definitely, like, I'm definitely reminded of how many parts there are where it's kind of boring, where it's like, oh, this is a lot of exposition. I know it's important exposition that we need the clues for later, but it's like, wow, nothing interesting has happened for a really long time. <laughs> and that kind of, like, reminded me about it, especially when I have to read it out loud myself, right? Obviously, if you get the game yourself and you just read it yourself, you could just... You know, click, 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 click. You can read faster than you can read out loud, right? If you download, if you get like the console version or download the Japanese voices mod, you can hear their voices too, which adds an extra level of, you know, level to the characters as well, but it's not quite the same, you know? If they did an official English dub, it'd be cool, but man, they'd have, they'd have to pay those, they have to pay those voice actors really well for all this reading. It's also kind of tricky because, I mean, uh, the, the, the translation, the official translation is actually from the fan translation too, which is why some of the translation is kind of weird, or a lot of the direct translations for like, you know, Pompeito or Onichan isn't localized because it's, it's all done by fans. And honestly, like the company behind, like, it was like, you know, if a bunch of fans fan translate your work and it's 151 hours of dialogue, not to mention all the programming and writing and translating, for free, I mean, you'd be a fool not to take them up on it, right? You love the Kiro style English dub. Well, I'm glad. It's hard because, like, this most of the characters are female, and I can't do that many different female voices. <laughs> and most of the men are just older men, so I just have like I only have like one older man voice I can do. But I'm glad you you enjoyed it. Also, of course, there's times where people are talking and it doesn't specify who's talking, so you kind of have to. I mean, I can make an educated guess because I know what's happening, but it's kind of hard to do on the fly. What else did I want to say about this game? I have so much to say about this game. <laughs> I really enjoyed reading it too. It's been fun. I think uh, getting a lot of people into it was a lot of fun. Well, thank you for the stretch, Kieran. I really appreciate it. You guys should make sure you stretch too. I think another thing I really like about this game is... Uh, you know how all the fights are kind of wacky, but they yet they all kind of fit into the rules. Like, the first time you start seeing humans start fighting it back against the illusions and prevailing is kind of cool and kind of badass. And you're kind of like, oh, but this actually follows the rules of the, the world. Like, Kyrie overpowering one of the seven sisters because she has more envy than her. It's like, oh, that actually kind of makes sense because her power is from envy and Kyrie has a lot of envy. And, or it's like, oh, this is a closed room. So suddenly, you know, um, Kyrie runs in the closed room and Jessica can't get her from there unless she lights the room on fire from outside like it's it's a lot of like wacky stuff happening but it like makes sense <laughs> in some kind of weird way rosa fighting against the goat Maria. that's one of my favorite scenes the music for that scene is really really good um that that's one of my favorite tracks and then seeing her call back to it in episode 8 fighting erica is pretty cool seeing the humans fight back against erica and showing that they're just as strong as the illusions pretty cool of course, Will is still my favorite character, and he <laughs> literally is, like, perfect and doesn't do anything wrong. Uh, obviously, because he's kind of made to be that way. 
Yeah, like Ange calling the sisters to kill her aunt and the bodyguards and stuff, like... There's so much stuff. Yeah, I think, yeah, some of the music's on the Spotify. I don't know if all of it is. Uh, I definitely recommend. Or even just, like, YouTube playlisting it. Unfortunately, a lot of it gets, like, copyrighted, so you can't really use it in a monetized video on YouTube, which is unfortunate, but that's fine. I wanted to keep the experience intact for everyone watching it on YouTube because the music is really what makes this game, right? Episode 8 was fun because it actually had, like, choices, like the riddles, Burn Castell's game, the choice at the end. I wish there were more, like, I wish there were more choices in the game. Like, maybe, I know it, obviously he wrote this episodically, but wouldn't it be cool if there was, like, depending on the choices you make, different people get murdered? And, like, each each message bottle plays out differently depending on how, like, you choose it. Like, maybe one of your first choices in the game determines whether you get onto, like, the episode 1 and 2 path or the episode 3 and 4 path. And then, obviously, it would not make as much sense because, because certain clues are revealed later than others. But I guess it would be too much like Zero Escape. We will be playing Zero Escape 2 and 3 eventually on the channel. And those have a lot of branching paths and stories and stuff, which is... I think it'd make Umineko pretty cool, but again, it'd be super hard to write, but... I think it'd be cool. <laughs> I don't plan on doing any other When They Cry series on Twitch and YouTube. It's just too long. Honestly, and the, and the characters... I think Higurashi might be interesting, but... Honestly, the character designs don't really appeal to me in Higurashi. I like Umineko because I kind of like the... The murder mystery, the Victorian... Vibes, but... Higurashi, you know, and even if I do, I'll probably just read it on my own. I actually don't know much about Chikonia, which is the next one. But, uh, again, if I if I really fall in love with it one day, maybe, you know, I won't say it's impossible, but maybe you have to wait for a miracle for me to do another series like this, because it's such a commitment. Now that we're done Umineko, I don't have to do, like, weekly Umineko streams. We can do, like, more games, mix it up. Maybe we should do more just chatting streams. <laughs> I keep telling myself I should do that. Or, or whatever. We'll see. We'll see. You're still thankful for me for introducing you to 999? I'm really glad that people like, uh, like that series. I really like 999 as well, and I think Zero Escape just blows it out of the water. So I'm excited to do it when we get a chance. Which might not be for a while. Yeah, and then the new Silent Hill is being written by Ryukishi, right? I really hope it's good. I think that's mostly all I want to say about this. Hey, this is Kiro from the future here. The next day after I finished uh, this Umineko stream, turns out, yes, there were a couple things that came to mind that I want to talk about, so I'm adding them to the video here. Uh, one thing I want to talk about is how the mystery genre and the movie genre, a lot of times they sometimes we'll make use of a plot device that involves a person having multiple personalities. You know, I'm not an expert, I'm not like a psychologist, although I've taken a number of psychology courses, but I'm pretty sure the way that they use multiple personalities is not scientifically sound, right? Or realistic. And we can sometimes suspend our disbelief for the sake of like, oh, this is a mystery media and they want to use this to set up these locked rooms or whatever. But I think it's important just to keep in mind that, you know, things like, for example, mental illness is very real and has real repercussions for real people, and to just be a bit sensitive about that matter. Now, like, the way they use it, I think, in this game is very clever. So I'm not saying, like, you know, I'm not saying that, oh, I, I think it's a flawless depiction of it. I just think it's a very clever use of it in one way, um, even though I think it is a trope that is done... Not like super often, but probably more often than, than you'd expect, especially in the mystery genre. I just want to kind of point that out. Now, the other things I want to mention was the dynamic between Bowler and Beatrice I think was really good. Uh, they start off as, you know, rivals, antagonists, and then eventually we find out about Beatrice's real motivation, and then we, you know, by the end we're like rooting for them and we think that they make a really good pair. And I think they've done a really good job of writing Beatrice in that way. Although it is a bit confusing with her whole, like, you know, she died and then she got reborn as Chick Beto, and then it was Beto the Elder, and, like, they represent different sides of Yasu before she creates the actual Beatrice, and and then after that Beatrice, like, revives, and then... But it's still, like, it's only, like, a meta-Beatrice. 
but not like it's like a piece because in episode five it was like a piece Beatrice that was in the game and not the meta Beatrice and then later the meta Beatrice revised but it's like but she's not like really the same Beatrice but she sort of is because Badler failed to get the answer by the end of episode four like it's kind of weird to think about if you think about that too much it does it does also kind of interesting that even though we really root for Badler and Beatrice and think we make they make a good pair because obviously they have a lot more screen time than George and Shannon and they in turn have more screen time than Jessica and Canon, but like if you really think about it, if we are to follow the ca the canonical timeline of Ange's future, then Balor and Beatrice weren't really together for very long in like as Balor and Beatrice. It was only be sometime between when Kyrie and Rudolph start massacring everyone until Balor and Beatrice escape on the motorboat, which is a very short period of time. Obviously, he somehow remembers his promise to Shannon slash Beatrice in the past. And of course, we just assume that it's because of all the meta stuff going on too. So, but it's kind of like in real time, it's not very much time, but we don't know how much meta time it took. You know what I mean? Because it, the separation between reality and fantasy is up to interpretation, right? I just thought that was kind of an interesting thing to point out because uh, I really like the idea of Beatrice and in terms of like an antagonist, especially because I find that in the mystery genre, uh, especially for like visual novels and stuff, it's important because you want to hide the identity of the culprit, but you also want a character or something identity to represent the culprit, especially for promotional materials, right? Like, for example, I'll, I'll say like in Danganronpa, we have Monokuma is the face of the antagonist, even though you, or most of the game, the mystery is who is Monokuma, and who's behind him, or is there someone behind him? And so you still have like a mystery of who is behind everything, but then you also have a face of the antagonist. Or in Zero Escape, you have Zero, the masked man that kidnaps everyone, but then it's like, what is Zero's identity? And so Beatrice kind of has that same quality, right? Or in Ace Attorney, you might not know who the culprit is right away, but then the prosecutor, in a way, is like the face of your antagonist. So you can still have a rival or someone that can be on the cover art without spoiling the culprit, for example. Because when you want to keep your culprit's identity secret, then it becomes really hard to draw nice promotional materials and art, right? Without having every single one of them laced with spoilers that would spoil your game for someone that hasn't experienced it yet. So in this game, Beatrice fulfills that role because we don't know who she is for most of it, which is kind of neat. And again, even if and if you haven't been, you know, paying close attention, then even by the end, you still don't know who she is, right? Unless someone explains it to you. I also think that Bern Castell was a very good antagonist. Very unexpectedly good, too, because she doesn't do much during the first four episodes as well. And then it really ramps up with episode five. And even though I think even though she's not an antagonist that we can per se relate to, she does have a backstory, even though it's given very briefly. But like she's not really someone we can relate to. But yet, I don't know, just something about the depths of how cruel she can be, and how good of an antagonist she is, how great like the roadblocks she puts up are, makes her really good. And like by extension, Erica is also a very good antagonist too. Although, you know, Burn Castell's the one controlling her, so she's kind of the the bigger one. But I think they're both very good antagonists, despite not having a relatable backstory, just because of how uniquely cruel they are. Uh, I think their cruelty probably rivals that of, if not more, than some of the other most cruelest antagonists I can think of, like Monokuma from Danganronpa, or the other one that comes to mind is Terami from the Blaze Blue series. Both very cruel antagonists that don't really have a relatable backstory, but yet have a little bit of charm to them somehow. Unlike, for example, I know I'll pick on this a lot, but some Final Fantasy game antagonists or final antagonists are just very bland, right? They're just evil god that pops out of nowhere you have to fight without much explanation or backstory or relatability or charm or personality or anything. So I just thought that was really, really interesting. Also, the way they handle Featherine as well, because we know Featherine's like super OP because she's like a writer of the world. She's literally creating the world. And the way they depict her battle with Land of Delta is very clever, in which they show us how powerful she is while also like hiding it because we don't even actually know what the battle looked like because she doesn't even 
No, she just decided what the ending was. But then the fact that even though she's the most powerful one and she is Burn Castell's master, she is not really the antagonist antagonist of the game, right? And even by the end, we can see that her real human counterpart, Ikuko, is not antagonistic. I just think the way they handle her is very interesting, and the only thing that I would think would be interesting about going and check out Higurashi, especially the new versions of Higurashi, is how they've kind of folded the use of, you know, Lambda Delta, Bern Castell, and Featherine, and their counterparts in those series into the plot, and how they're there might be, there's probably some kind of, you know, overarching when they cry multiverse going on, but I don't really feel like going through all of Higurashi and maybe Chikonia or whatever to find all these relations, but I just think the idea of it is interesting, especially since Umineko is technically the second entry in the series, or if you want to be specific, it's the third and fourth entries in the series, because there's uh, questions arc and then answers arc. Anyways, those are just some other closing thoughts that I had the day after finishing the game that I want to mention. And so let's get back to the VOD and wrap it up. I think that's it. Any other closing thoughts? I kind of talked for a while. Talked for a bit longer than I expected, but yeah. Umaneko, thank you so much for joining me on this long journey. Thank you so much for following along and getting involved and enjoying the, the series as well. I really, really appreciate it. It's nice to be able to share this with a lot more other people as well. You hope there's a golden butterfly somewhere in the new Silent Hill? I can't believe it's been almost a year. Reading Umineko. It would've been cool if we ended on Halloween, right? <laughs> Alas, it was not to be. I do want to do like more spooky games this October, and also Spider-Man 2 comes out on October 20th, so I'll be playing that on Halloween most probably. Yeah, especially those of you that like joined in for a long time and uh, made all the jokes and the recurring memes as well. I really <laughs> appreciate all those. I, I need to give a shout out to to Lork Demper as well. By the way, Lork always sends me the funniest memes that he makes based on the games that we play. And every time I'm about to finish a game on stream, he always sends me like a meme that is usually involving characters from the game wishing me good luck to finish the game while also having some kind of like inside jokes from our streams <laughs> in the image so today he sent me an Umaneko picture with all the Umaneko characters in a collage that he put together wishing me good luck on finishing Umaneko and I'm like man you're the best fan <laughs> the, the, the Final Fantasy 16 one was also pretty good too he made one for Final Fantasy 16 he also made one for Raincoat but that one was a little more Jokey. Maybe we'll share them all on stream one day, just for fun. Let's have a look and see who we should raid. I feel like I'm probably going to, like, finish this video and then I'm gonna be awake, I'm gonna be asleep at night and I'm suddenly gonna jolt up awake and be like, I, I remember something I was gonna say during that last Zoom and Echo stream and I forgot. That happens to me so much for games, and I have to go back and like edit the YouTube video so it has my extra thoughts in it. But I think that's pretty much everything, because I actually wrote it down this time. But I hope you guys enjoyed Umineko. Again, I, I recommend that you take the time to go through it yourself one day. Or maybe check out Higurashi or Chikonia and tell me how it is. Because <laughs> I don't plan to. At least not yet. Okay. Let's see, my friend Yui is doing a Donathon today. I think he's trying to raise some emergency funds, so we're going to drop in on on him. And I'll see you guys next time for more Spider-Man. We're almost done Spider-Man PS4. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Hope you guys have a great night. Stick around for the raid. I'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.